Hello, hello, I'm Brutton, one of our MCAT tutors here at Inspira Advantage, where we help students get to medical school and other professional programs. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of waves. Understanding waves and their characteristics is not only for the MCAT, but also for many aspects of medicine, from interpreting EKGs to understanding the physics of sound in the stethoscope. So let's ride the wave and get on in. Waves come in two main types, transverse and longitudinal. Transverse waves, like light, have oscillations of wave particles perpendicular in the direction of wave propagation. Imagine ripples spreading out when you throw a pebble in a pond. On the other hand, Longitudinal waves, the one on top here, is like a sound wave. They have oscillations of wave particles parallel in the direction of wave propagation. Think of a slinky, how it moves when you push it and pull it from one end to another. Another way to think about this is a pressure wave. That's how we call sound. Sound is a pressure wave. There's just high and low densities of matter moving along in a wave-like pattern. Well, what is wave-like? What are wave characteristics? Each wave is characterized by its speed, frequency, and wavelength, or V, F, and lambda. The speed of the wave is given by the product of its frequency and wavelength, represented by this equation here, velocity equals frequency times wavelength. Another key term to know is displacement. Displacement refers to how far a point on the wave is from the equilibrium position, while amplitude is the magnitude of its maximal displacement. Picture a calm sea. The displacement would be the height of the wave above the calm water, and the amplitude would be the height from the calm water to the crest of the wave. So displacement can be anywhere on the wave, but amplitude will always be the same value, and it's always going to be an absolute value of it. So even if we measured below, we wouldn't say, oh, this is negative amplitude. We'd square it. We'd put absolute value bars on each side. So A is just going to be equal to negative A, so on and so forth. Another key value to know is wavelength. The easiest way to measure this is just from amplitude to amplitude, or you could also do trough to trough, or any point to any point, as long as it's one wavelength apart. But the frequency is a little different. Frequency is the number of cycles that the wave makes per second. So the period is the number of seconds it takes to complete a cycle, and it is the inverse of frequency. So if you can find period or frequency, it's really easy to get the other. You just take one over frequency to get period, or one over period to get frequency. And that's on period, or that's on one over frequency. Next, let's talk about different types of interferences. So waves can interact with each other in a ph phenomenon known as interference. Constructive interference, this occurs when the waves are in phase, and the amplitudes of the resultant waves equals the sums of the amplitudes of the interfering waves. In simple terms, we take two small waves that are occurring at the same time, and it's just going to make a bigger wave. So it's going to make that peak taller and that trough smaller. Let's compare this to destructive interference. This is going to occur when the waves are exactly out of phase, and the amplitude of the resultant waves is going to equal the distance, the difference in amplitudes of the interfering waves. Partially constructive or destructive interference occurs when waves are not quite perfectly in or out of phase. So in this case, we have a peak and a trough and a trough and a peak, perfectly on top of each other, so this is going to equal just a flat line. Now moving to traveling and standing waves, and this is kind of difficult to show on a 2D surface, so I'll try and use my arms as well, so pay attention to the top corner here. A traveling wave is going to continuously shift points of maximum and minimum displacement, so it's a wave that is moving through space. Look at me in the top little screen. If you missed it, rewind there. Versus a standing wave, which are formed by the constructive and destructive interferences of two waves of the same frequency traveling in opposite directions in the same space. So this would be like if you've ever held a rope between two people, you kind of swing it back and forth, and you just see the same standing wave, like it would go up and down, but not travel, it wouldn't propagate along. So a standing wave would look something like this, where we're just going to flip it as time goes on, instead of moving in a velocity some direction. And finally, resonance and dampening. This one is kind of straightforward, but they're weird terms. So I recommend onkying these. Resonance, basically, it's just 
means that there's going to be an increase in amplitude that occurs when there a periodic force is applied at the natural or resonant frequency of an object. Sort of like pushing a swing at just the right moment. Whereas dampening decreases the amplitude caused by applied or non-conservative forces, akin to the slowing of a swing when you stop it or just due to the friction of the air as the swing moves through it, slowing it down. Let's put these concepts into practice. Suppose we have a transverse wave on a string with a frequency of 5 hertz, a wavelength of 2 meters, and an amplitude of 0.01 meters. What is the speed of the wave? Give the video a pause and see if you can figure this out for yourself. All right, let's take a look here. So first thing we want to ask ourselves is what is the equation we need? Well, we're trying to solve velocity. And if we look back up here, we were given velocity equals frequency times lambda. So let's pull that on down. Velocity equals frequency times lambda. We're looking for V. We have F, which is 5 hertz, and our lambda is 2 meters. So our velocity becomes just 10. And this is hertz, not per second. So how did we get velocity, which is a meters per second value? Well, hertz is actually equal to 1 over seconds. So then this does work out, and we see where meters per second comes from. So our units are good. This is making sense. And our answer is going to be 10. As always, understanding these concepts is key to mastering the chem phys sections of the MCAT. So keep practicing and happy studying. I'll see you in the next video where we'll continue unraveling the mysteries of physics. Thank you so much for watching our videos on waves and I will see you next time.